Okay, we're going to get started today. Welcome to the Friday seminar. I'm pleased to introduce. I'm pleased to introduce James Fogarty, he's the associate professor of computer science and engineering at the University of Washington. Uh, he's also director of Dub. Dub takes some uh, explanation. Dub <laughs> is short for U Dub, which is University of Washington. We do a lot of dubs at UW, right? Well, it's Here also it short for design, use, build. I had to look that up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> short for design, use, build. It's a, at uh, University of Washington, there are lots of people who do HCI type work. Some of them are in the School of Information. Some of them are in computer science and engineering. Some are in human-centered design and engineering. And some of the division of design. Holy cow. All right. So the reason <laughs> all of these people are dispersed and they come together in this one group called Dub, and he's the director of that. James has done a lot of really interesting work on uh, sensors, about interruptibility. He's worth Googling, uh, finding out all the stuff that he's done. But today he's talking about unlocking data and <coughs> unlocking interaction. So let's welcome James Fogarty. Thank you, Judy. Um, and uh, following on that introduction, I'll say that uh, I've explained to a couple people today that Judy is one of the people that I became aware of uh, even as an early undergrad, and so I accidentally hold her on this very high pedestal. Um, and so when she, when she sent me an email, just very casually saying, you know, we'd love to hear about some of your, your research and your approach to stuff. I took that very seriously. It's like, no, I need to come give a really good talk that really explains my approach to research and, and, and how to think about that. Um, and so uh, I'm going to talk about interface tools today using a, a set of examples to do that. Um, I've put my slides uh, at tiny.cc slash chapo temporarily if anybody needs those to follow along as we're going through. Um, years ago, somebody with a vision impairment asked to put slides and it's like, oh yeah, that's a really easy thing to do. <laughs> so, um, so I want to start by reminding us all that interactive systems are continuing to grow, right? So we're talking about more and more devices, more and more data, more and more people involved in everyday interaction. Um, and if you go back to, to Weiser, uh, right, he talks about, you know, we're, we're well past this age of many people to one computer, we're well past this age of one person to one computer, and we're somewhere in this era of transition between uh, many devices to a person or uh, many people connected through many devices, right? And so this is really daunting. Um, in part, it's really daunting because of the sheer volume of code that holds this all together, right? The complexity is impressive. Uh, it's amazing that it works at all, right? And uh, what I want to talk about today is the fact that most of us don't see that complexity because basically every application is developed using some form of tool, right? We use some tool that encapsulates a lot of that complexity, hides it from us, and allows us to focus on the applications that we're building. And in particular, I'm going to talk about how the tools that we use frame and even define the design of the applications that we build, and, and some implications of that. So I'm far from the first person to point this out. Um, some classic tools theory in a nutshell, if you're not familiar with this. Um, so the, the purpose of a tool, something like an interface tool or a toolkit, is to encapsulate proven practices and make those easy for, for you to, to use. And so we... Um, no longer think about double buffering in order to make our interfaces not flicker when they render. It just happens because we know we should do that and it's hidden inside of the toolkit. And so we reduce the expertise barriers to getting good behaviors. Most of us don't even know what double buffering is anymore, but there was a time when we all had to do that, right? Um, and this similarly allows more rapid iteration and implementation. So we spend our time focusing on the unique aspects of our application the unique problems in our design, we focus our attention there, we iterate more quickly, more effectively, get better designs out, instead of hacking at the low-level stuff. This comes inevitably with a trade-off. The trade-off is always that eventually your tools constrain your design. This has nothing to do with whether your tool was good or bad when you made it. It is inevitable. It will come to constrain your design. This is because the um, technology ecosystem continues to change, the context of usage around that technology continues to change, and so at some point, some assumptions that you've codified into your tools eventually no longer apply, and the tools become a constraint on your design. And the thing I'm going to focus on today is that that codification goes deeper than the code. It goes deeper than how much code you're willing to write. It goes into how you even think about what your application might be. Okay, so I'm going to use a couple of examples to make this point. 
Um, I'm going to start with unlocking data and our work on interactive machine learning. And then I'm going to switch over to unlocking interaction and our work on pixel-based interface modification. There's a little bit of a just trust me minute there uh, as I, I put these two dots together. Um, and then I'm going to get to connecting the dots and talk about how tools define the language of interaction. Um, and then switch over to talk about self-tracking and personal informatics, uh, where I'm working a lot more right now. So, unlocking data. A lot of our existing notion of how to interact with things is being fundamentally broken by the new types of data that we try to interact with and the scale of that data as we try to interact with it. Um, and so in the beginning, there was a very small number of things and we could actually remember them and we typed them in by recall, right? Um, and then there were too many and so we put them on the screen and we pointed at them. And then there were too many and so we put them into hierarchies and we browsed down the hierarchy to the thing that we wanted. And then there were too many and so we started using keywords to get to them and we've been getting by on keyword search for about 30 years now. Right? And the problem is that there's an increasing variety of data for which keywords are not an appropriate way to try to interact with that data. There's no meaningful keyword to articulate the kinds of things you're trying to say. And so documents were easy because they're made out of keywords, but eventually we have to deal with these other kinds of data. And so the example that I want to use here is some work that we did in image search. Uh, this is a system called QFLIC. Um, and the problem is that keywords are generally insufficient for describing the visual characteristics of an image. And so um, these images here are all of stereos, but they also all have the property that I will call them a product image, right? It's a nice crisp image of a product on a relatively clear background. And so how would we access these images? And so we'll do the first thing. We'll go, in, go out and do our web image search for stereo. We'll get a bunch of images back. Um, it turns out there's a band called Soda Stereo. I didn't know this until I did this research. They have a lot of album covers, <laughs> and you get all of their album covers. Um, you also get stereo microscope images, stereo telescope images. You get some images of stereos which are not product photos, right? Um, and so only about 10% of these images are the kind of image that we want. And so we do the obvious thing, which is reformulate the query, right? So now we'll do it as stereo on a white background. We'll describe the kind of image that we want. Unfortunately, this doesn't work. Only about 12% of the images are the kinds of images that we're looking for. The reason this doesn't work is that all of these engines work the same. They basically take keywords from the context of an image, like the link to the image, the image file name, um, text that's in the web page near the image. And nobody puts this into their web page and says stereo on a white background. It's obviously on a white background, right? And so we can't access these images using this kind of a keyword query. The keywords are just not there as a way to articulate it. So what we did. <coughs> Um, one more point before we go to what we did is that this is not a hard computer vision problem, right? You can lock an undergrad in a room for a couple hours and get a decent classifier out to do this. It's a very trivial recognition problem. The, the, the challenge is that there's a countless number of these kinds of distinctions that a people might want to make in something like image data, right? And we can't possibly pre-support all of these things or brainstorm all of the distinctions that a person might want to make. You can't launch a search engine that has 300 checkboxes as the front page when you get there and try to access things, right? Um, so how do you allow people to articulate these kinds of things in their data? And so what we looked at was the idea of interactively training a classifier that corresponds to this concept. So you take the set of images, you say, well, here's the kind of image that I want. As a positive example, the system goes off and learns a model and updates the set of images that it's showing you. You say, okay, well, this is not the kind of image that I want. It goes off and updates the model and updates the set of images that it's showing you. And you give it a, a third positive example, or a second example, positive example, and say, updates the model and says, okay, so these are product photos now. It's got some notion of a product photo. It's showing those, those images to you. And so what we've done in this interaction is interactively define a new concept. We've given examples, defined a new concept, and extended the language of interaction that we have with the underlying system, right? We can now use this Thanks. So, so it kind of looks like recommender feedback as I've described it, or I'm sorry, relevance feedback as I've described it here. But the thing that we made different was we actually surfaced this as a top level element in the interaction. It's now an adjective. So we could reuse that filter that we trained right. We can go over and search for phone or television and get product photos if that's what we want. Right? And so it's, it's really this idea of an adjective in the data that allows us to describe the kinds of images that we want. Um, okay. So 
we did a bunch of follow-on research here. One of the things that, so we, lo we looked at different domains. We looked at so social network friend group creation. We looked at uh, information extraction on the web. Um, and we looked at a bunch of different notions that are raised by the fact that this language is implicit. We can't actually talk about the language. Qflick is implemented as learning a similarity metric in image space over some histograms. And we can't say, oh, it looks like you're giving us images that say something about the edge the entropy of the edge histogram. Like That doesn't mean anything to the people who are accomplishing this task, right? And so we just had to give examples in both directions to try to get convinced that the person in the system had the same understanding of the concept that we were trying to articulate. And what I want to do, though, is go to an example where we made that language much more explicit. And so this is in the, in the context of uh, recognizing symbolic gestures. So um, this is the, the problem here is that you, know, you draw something like that thing on the left, and you've now got to determine, you know, is that a carrot? Is it an arrow? Is it a delete? Is it a pigtail? And you might do this in any kind of a drawing package, in any kind of a gesture package, right? Um, and the, the standard approach to this problem is through example-based gesture recognition. I've got on, the, on, on your right there um, a bunch of examples of kinds of gestures, right? So a spring, a couple different kinds of arrows. They each have a different head, so that might mean something different in the tool that you're using. Um, and then this W uh, line O gesture on the bottom, that's, for example, search on Wikipedia by write a W and then circle the thing you want to search for, right? And so a gesture comes in. We resample it into a discrete set of points. We then compute a feature vector from those points. So some summary statistics of the gesture as uh, is uh, phrased in terms of these points. We've already computed that vector for all of these examples that we have in our library. And so then what we do is we need some kind of a similarity metric by which we can compare uh, these vectors. Um, and in this case, uh, the one in the middle is most similar. And so we declare this to be an instance of arrow one, right? Because its vector is most like the other vector. This is the standard approach to this problem. What we did in gesture script was extend this with an explicit language for describing the structure of the gestures. Um, so we're going to preserve this initial ease of demonstration. You can just give examples and it will recognize them. Um, but when you need more power and expressiveness, we're going to allow you a language to describe the structure of the gestures. And so here's two arrows. If you give these two examples and your system is able to reliably differentiate them, great, you're done. Right? If it doesn't, what do you do? Well, if the only thing you can do is give examples, you just give it more examples and hope that it figures it out. Right? Um, alternatively, you use a different gesture, which is not as good for your application, but is easier for the system to differentiate. Right? And that kind of feels like giving up. Um, and so what we did here was allowed you to provide a very simple script that describes the structure of these gestures. So they both begin with a line, and then the first one ends with one type of arrowhead, and the second one begins with a, ends with a different type of arrowhead. Now, our system has no notion of what a line is. It has no notion that a line is the shortest path between two points. It doesn't know what head one or head two is. You could have called these cat, dog, and bird. That would make your variable names really bad. But it would still work the same. It would have the same meaning to the system. So it then is able to look at this and say, oh, well, based on that, I will take your examples and I will segment them into parts. And it appears that this thing you call a line is in both of these examples. And it looks like this. And this thing which you call head one is over here and looks like this. And the thing you call head two is, looks like this over here. And so it was able to do that from just those examples and those scripts. So this gives us that control, this ability to define the language together with the system. It also enables greater complexity in our language. And so this kind of a, a spring gesture is actually really hard to recognize because of the variable number of caps that might be inside of this. Right? So if there's two, three, four, five, or six caps, you and I will all look at it and say it's a spring, but it looks very different in that vector space that we described as how these things work. And so what we can do is tell it, no, look, there's going to be a head, then one or more caps, and then a tail. Right? And so then the system is able to use that example together with that language and recover the appearance of the parts. And then the last thing it enables is interactivity. So we can actually explicitly help the system get the correct understanding of the language. And so here we've, we've got our arrow, and it's learned a very misguided notion of what a line is, because it's just had to guess from our one example. And so we can go in, on one hand, and interactively correct that segmentation. We take the example, and it's got the set of points that it's sampling from, and you say, no, this is the boundary between a line and a head two. And so then it updates its model of the parts. Alternatively, we can actually go in and just give it an example of a head two. We can say, look, this is what head two looks like, and it updates its model of the parts. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to see all of that come together in a, a short video here.
Um, how is going to work on training these gestures. He first defines the, the structure of this W line O gesture as starting with a W, then having a line, and then a circle. Right, and so like I said, this might be a search on Wikipedia. So he asks it to learn it, and it learns a very poor notion of what these three parts are, right? It's, it's just trying to guess, it's randomly guessed a notion of what the language here is. It's trying to learn something simple, but it's just bad. Um, and so what he's gonna do is show it what a circle looks like by drawing a circle there. That's gonna then allow the system to update its notion of a circle, and it will actually also improve its notion of a line and a W as a consequence. And so now it knows what the three parts like, and it knows where the segments are. This is a circle line circle gesture, maybe like cut and paste, right? Um, it's composed of circles and lines, and so he defines that structure as consisting of those three parts, those two types of parts. The system already knows about circles and lines from the other gesture, right? The language is globally scoped across the gesture set that you're, you're creating, and so it's now able to combine all of these demonstrations together and improve its notion of circle, but also just recognize what a circle is when it encounters it here. Um, he similarly is then going to go and work on getting the arrows right. He defines this one as consisting of a series of four lines. This is giving it more and more examples of what a line is, and it's getting a better and better understanding of that concept. This one consists of two lines and an arc. Um, this is the first time he's used the notion of an arc as a, as a part, and so it has to learn a definition of that from this example. Okay? So that's gesture script. Um, and what gesture script does is um, and what the, these two systems are intended to illustrate is this idea of interactive machine learning as giving us a language for interacting with data that, for which we other li otherwise lack that language, right? And what do you say over a set of um, images? What do you say over an ink stroke? What do you call these things? Um, and so it enables new kinds of expressiveness for end users and data and can give developers new control um, in applications that involve some machine learning element. Okay, this is where I ask you to just Stay with me for a minute, I'm gonna make a jump and I promise to connect the dots a little bit later. So we're gonna go over and talk about pixel-based interface modification right now. Um, and I wanna start by saying that this is also an interaction language, right? It's an interaction language that consists of a tree, which is defined by the containment of some widgets inside of other widgets. Everything in this language is a rectangle for weird historical reasons that most of us don't know or would prefer to forget. Um, and it looks like that and we're all very familiar with it. I will further claim that this is the same interaction language, right? It's all the same parts on the same tree in the same rectangles. It's perhaps a slightly different dialect of the same language. So this is a very mature language. We've had it with us for 40 years, right? And we, we all interact with it and speak it fairly fluently. Um, and then what I further want to say is here's three proposed interactions. Um, I'm not going to dive into the details of them. Um, all the way on your left, you have the bubble cursor. This is a cursor that always snaps to the nearest target. So you're always pointing at exactly one thing, right? Um, the phosphor is an effect. Um, so the, by the way, the bubble cursor might be advantageous, for example, where a person with a motor impairment has trouble pointing at things. You're able to always snap to the nearest target. Um, phosphor is an effect that whenever a widget is manipulated, it leaves an afterglow that illustrates the, the manipulation that has happened. When Patrick presented this, he motivated it by, for example, if uh, you're in a collaborative software tool or something like that, and somebody else is manipulating the widgets, you're change blind to that unless you're looking at it exactly the time that they do it. And so this makes the manipulation of those widgets visible to you um, in some kind of a collaborative context. Um, and then sliding widgets all the way on the right are the idea that for, um, instead of tapping to activate a button, you slide on it. And this you would wanna do if the targets, for example, are very small. In this case, the finger is so large that it's actually touching two targets, but we're able to disambiguate which target you're trying to activate by the fact that they are slidden in different directions to activate them, and also that it can give you a little bit of visual feedback as you're starting to slide it. You can see that you're, in fact, dragging the correct one, right? So these are three really good ideas. Turns out Bubble Cursor won a best paper at Kai 10 years ago, right? Um, phosphor and sliding widgets are also well-known techniques, um, and none of them are in that interaction language that I just showed you. Turns out we've had these ideas for like 10 years and we can't, we don't have them, <laughs> right? I want my, I want my bubble cursor um, and yet we can't have it for different reasons across the three. And they're, they're, they're subtle, I'm not gonna drop into the reasons, but the point is we should be able to have these and yet we don't. And further, it's not really enough to rewrite one application and rebuild one thing, right? So most, most, of, the, most of the world is closed source, as it turns out, right? And so we can't rebuild Facebook. 
But even if we could and we put the bubble cursor into it, we still wouldn't have it in Office or email or Chrome or anything else, right? So these are the techniques. We really want them to work across our whole desktop. We really want them to be part of the entire interaction language, not just inside of one thing. And so what Prefab did was look at the idea of using the raw pixels of an interface. There's all of these different things producing things on your screen, but they all end in pixels. We try to use the raw pixels to um, enhance an existing interface and try these new types of techniques in the context of existing applications. And so the way that that works, if you look really, really closely at something like Photoshop, we'll go down and we'll look in the color palette selector here, and then we'll look a little bit closer at these sliders, and they are pixel-wise identical. There is no shadow, there is no perspective, there is no distortion, there is no natural variation. They are rendered by a piece of code and they are rendered in exactly the same way every single time they are drawn. Right? And so what we learned to do is recognize these exact patterns of pixels. It's the same thing in the corner of the button. It's the same thing in the, the gap between these tabs. They look exactly the same. And so what Prefab does is take an image of an interface, use just the raw pixels to recover an understanding of that interface, what is in the image. If you don't know what's in an image, the only thing you can do is like make it bigger or smaller or invert the colors. But once you know what's in the image, you can use that semantic understanding of the image to draw different things instead of the image that you captured. And so we draw a different interface onto this application. When you interact with our interface, we map the input back to the underlying interface. And if you run around this loop many times per second, it looks like we changed the application, even though we only changed your view onto the application. Right? And so we're able to change these applications, add new functionality onto them, all without their source code, without their cooperation, without them even knowing that we're doing it. Right? And so um, here's our bubble cursor running entirely off of pixel-based targeting. Right? So we're snapping to all of these widgets as we move around just based on our pixel understanding. This is all live, just being recorded on Morgan's laptop as he, as he does this. Right? Um, and we're doing it at frame rate, as you can see here, as he moves around and snaps to that. OK, so we do this by taking something like a slider like this and breaking it into its parts, right? So we can take the slider. It has that big blue thumb in the middle. It has those endpoints of the trough, and it has this repeating pattern that is that trough that it moves around. And this is capable of describing the appearance of that slider no matter where the thumb is in there. Similarly, we can take one button like this, rip it into nine parts, and then we can recognize any other Microsoft Steel button independent of its size or its content based on identifying these patches. And so the way we'll use that to implement Phosphor is to watch different frames of the interaction. When we observe the thumb at one location um, and then in another, we will understand that by identifying the location of these parts. We'll render a shadow of the thumb at the old location and then an afterglow showing the transition to the new location. Um, this is actually surprisingly subtle because even if we were running inside the application itself, even if it was open source, there's no API to tell you the appearance of the thumb. It's intentionally encapsulated. Why do you care what the thumb looks like? You just set it to a number between 0 and 100, right? Um, and so this, this technique would be hard to implement even inside it. Um, but here it's running inside of uh, Windows Media Player. Although I'm coming from Seattle, I do not have the source code to Windows Media Player. Um, <laughs> And so it's just being done as an overlay on top in real time. Right? Um, and in this next example, what we do is we remote desktop into a Mac. Our code is still running on the PC, and it's going to target the widgets that are coming over the remote desktop connection from the Mac. This is to show that our demo is clean. We're not even running on the PC that this application is running on. right? And whoa, there we go. Okay. Um, so it's actually the same code. We've just given it a different notion. We've told it what sliders look like, what widgets look like on the Mac versus what widgets look like on the PC. It's the, it, but it's still the same code running that was applying these effects inside of Windows Media Player. OK. So um, and the, the last demo here is the sliding widget enhancement. So sliding widgets, what we're going to do here is replace a, wid a widget that is designed for pressing with a widget that is designed for these slide gestures. The visual effect is pretty subtle because we leave most of the interface alone. It's, it's supposed to be subtle. Um, and one reason you might want to do this is we've got this generation of hybrid devices that are emerging now, right, where there are both mouse and touch support, right? So you can interact with your mouse and then you can reach up and touch the screen. And of course, when your targets are tiny, tiny, tiny things like that designed to interact with the mouse, they're really hard to touch, right? And so what you'll see 
in a video here is that, and the, the video is a little rough because it has to be shot from outside the screen, right? You're going to see the, the mouse moving around, interacts with the widgets with the mouse, then he touches the screen, and the mouse widgets are going to be replaced with sliding widgets. Um, he'll interact with it with touch, and then he'll go back to interacting with the mouse. And again, all without the application even realizing this is happening. So the spin controls are a great example of a widget, which is tiny if you just try to touch it. But the, the sliding gesture makes it really easy to disambiguate which gesture you're trying to make. OK, so what Prefab does is it takes this, this rigid language that we've defined over the past 40 years and the fact that it's fragmented across all of these different tools that are driving these applications and allows us to get past that because that prevents us from even trying out these techniques, seeing if they work in practice. It prevents us from getting these ideas into the world. Prefab lets us try that out. Um, based off of the raw pixels. Um, and so these designs, which are otherwise prohibited, we get to see if they work in these actual interfaces. OK, so now I promised to connect those dots. Um, so I have been using the word language um, intentionally here. And so if you're familiar, I am going to probably mispronounce this, but the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis roughly says that there are some thoughts in one language which either cannot be stated or cannot be understood in another language. Right? So this is the idea that your language um, either constrains or defines or influences your thought, depending on different notions of what you think the hypothesis is. Um, and what I want to say is that our tools define the language of our interaction. Right? This is, again, not just a simple matter of the code, but what we consider might even be possible if we were willing to write enough code. Right? And so. What are the ways in which we might try to query over images? What are the kinds of gestures that I might consider using in my application? What are the kinds of techniques that I might deploy in my collaboration software? Right? If you can't even conceive of building these, then you can't conceive of including them in your applications. And the really interesting thing about tools, in contrast to like spoken natural language, is that every so often we throw the entire language away and rebuild the whole thing again from scratch. Right? And so we've done this many, many times. So we went from the command line and text screens, then we had multiple generations of desktop technology, all of which completely threw away the code from before. Nobody runs Windows 3.1 anymore, right? But there were a lot of really big, heavy pieces of software built there. And they were all thrown away and rewritten in new things. We did the same thing on the web, right? And same multiple generations on the web, from the old static web to the rich client. Now we're getting these thin clients. We're getting responsive. We throw it all away and write it again. Doing it in mobile apps, right? You better have an app now. And then the exciting thing, or the really disturbing thing, depending on how you think about it, is that we're going to do it again. And we're going to do it again soon for multiple different reasons, right? Even if you ignore augmented reality and virtual reality, just so that, that's not here yet. Like, we're still figuring that out. It's just for games. Even if we ignore all that, touch, right? So the, the entire idea that not just that I can tap on things, but that these, the, the current notion of touch reduces my entire hand to a single pixel cursor, like it's a mouse. And that's really constraining on the kinds of touch interactions that I can have. And as I, as I figure out what kinds of touch interactions I want to have, we're going to rebuild all the applications and the language of those applications to support it. Right? Because right now, point, everything is defined by the idea of one pixel, right? which is the point on your end of your cursor. The cloud, so Dropbox is great. I love Dropbox, right? Dropbox is saying we're going to use a folder, and we're going to synchronize it into the cloud, and that'll be how you access the cloud, is through this folder on your file system. Sounds an awful lot like a horseless buggy driving on the horse path, right? <laughs> we, we haven't figured out what it means to actually interact with the cloud yet, what it means to actually have our data in the cloud. And so we're using the file system as a metaphor for the cloud, but it's a clearly limiting metaphor. And then you know, distributed interfaces, the idea that we have four or five devices that we're interacting with at the same time, simultaneously, all of which are different windows onto the same application. What does it mean to build that? What does it mean to interact with that? We don't know. And we're going to figure it out, and we're going to rebuild the whole infrastructure to support these things. Right? So what research and tools is, is the idea that we explore what goes in the next generation of language while simultaneously being limited by the expressiveness of the current generation of language. Right? And as a consequence, we conflate what our ideas are 
what the proof of concept of that idea is, the engineering to make the idea actually work, the implementation of that engineering in a particular system, the broken metaphors, right? So the things that we've carried over from the old language, which are dumb and stupid and don't make any sense anymore, but we haven't figured that out yet, or we haven't figured out the, the right way to do it in the new language, and then the like unspeakably dirty hacks that we needed just to make it work for now, but it's never intended to be part of the vision, right? Um, and we, we, we have a hard time telling these things apart. And so like prefab is not just about do everything with pixels. So every so often we present prefab and we get the, the, the recursion question, as you might call it in computer science, right? So, okay, great, can I change something based on the pixels and then change something based on the pixels of that and change something based on the pixels of that and like layer up layers and layers of pixel interpretation. It's not the point, right? Maybe, I don't know. Um, the point is not about doing everything with pixels, it's about exploring the new language in the current ecosystem. And the interactive machine learning isn't just about images, it's not just about gestures. It's about control and expressiveness with this new kind of data and our everyday interaction with that new kind of data. So, that brings me to, to self-tracking and personal informatics where I'm working a lot right now. Um, and the point that I want to say is that you know, our tools and the way in which they frame our understanding are currently limiting how we think about self-tracking and what we want to do in self-tracking. And so, uh, let's talk about personal informatics, right? So here's Lee's definition. Uh, personal informatics is systems that help people collect personally relevant information for the purpose of self-reflection and gaining knowledge. And this is very personal, right? It's data about me intended to support my own understanding, my own knowledge about myself, right? It's a fundamental new notion of data that we're gonna act interact with all the time. Um, so we see this in things like Fitbit, um, we see this in things like MyFitnessPal, the new generation of health devices like glucose meters, smart glucose meters. Um, I don't have it on the slide here. There's something called FitBark. It's like for your dog, right? Um, <laughs> and in a case you think you're, you're like not one of those people, right? You know, you're not into all of that. Um, I'm sorry to tell you that like financial self-tracking, whether it's in Mint or in like a spreadsheet or your notebook, meets all of these definitions, right? So we're all doing this unless you have so much money you don't even track it anymore. Um, <laughs> we should talk. Um, so, um, this is personal informatics. Um, and there's a lot of important framings here, right? I, I, so, so one of the big differences that we've made is the difference of personal agency, how much agency do I have in the difference between persuasive technology, right? A technology which knows what's good for me and tries to persuade me to do it versus behavior change technology, which is I'm a person who wants to make a change in my behaviors and it's a technology that supports me in doing that. I think these are very big differences and I think they're really important. But this is a talk about tools and the framing, right? So I'm not gonna go into all of that, <laughs> right? Um, and so, so all of that is incredibly important. So the tool that I wanna talk about is the pager. Who had a pager? I had a pager. How many of us have pagers? Okay, it turns out all of you have pagers. Um, so, our notion of what technology design is for something like journaling, for something like experience sampling, for something like ecological momentary assessment, has been shaped by the pager. And this is because we started out with these paper journals that we would keep these notes in and we'd bring back to our provider, um, or to a researcher who was asking us to collect this data. And then at some point, somebody saw this new technology come out, right? It was the pager, and I could actually page you because people always forget to fill in their journals. Right, so I could send you a page uh, you know, twice a day or whatever, and whenever you got the page, you knew that what you were supposed to do was get out your paper notebook and fill in the data that I was supposed to be getting from you. Right? Um, and then phones got smarter, so we said, oh, I can not only make the phone buzz, you can actually fill out the thing on the phone. You don't need the other notebook anymore. I just buzz the phone, and whenever the phone buzzes, you know that you're supposed to fill in the information. And then we got really good phones with like lots of complexity. And we're like, great, you can buzz the phone and then you can answer a 37 question <laughs> form on your iPhone uh, in response to the buzz. And then we complain about the low compliance and that people won't do these things when we buzz their phones. Right? So, um, and I want to contrast that with some work that we've done. Um, this is a technique called unlock journaling. Um, it's inspired directly from a technique called slide to X that Kai Trong had at Kai a couple years ago. And um, the basic idea is that unlock gesture on your phone is completely wasted, right? You do it and it confirms to your phone that you are not just a pocket, right? But it doesn't do anything. 
Um, and so the idea is, can we instead turn the act of unlocking your phone into a very simple self-report? And so this is the Stanford sleepiness scale. It's a uh, seven point, it's a validated seven point scale for uh, journaling how tired you are throughout the day. If you're looking for different influences on your, your um, self-reported sleepiness. And what happens is he just puts his thumb on the icon, he drags it to the point on the scale that he currently wants to journal and releases. This simultaneously unlocks his phone and journals that number as his current self-reported sleepiness. Very importantly, the lock icon is still there. You can still just unlock your phone by sliding the thumb to the lock icon. We're not gonna hold your phone hostage waiting for you to give a self-report, right? We don't want you to give us bad data just to get into your phone. Um, this is uh, pleasure versus accomplishment. It's a little bit more complicated. There's two different scales here, right? So if you're self-monitoring for depressive symptoms, you might want to journal whether your activities are bringing you pleasure or whether they are bringing you accomplishment. If they are continuously over time bringing you neither, that is something you want to pay attention to. And so um, how do you choose which thing to journal is the question while still doing this in a single gesture. And so what we do is put two thumbs on the screen. And when you just choose which one to put your thumb on, you drag it, you release. Right? And it, again, it unlocks your phone and does the journaling. Um, this is uh, Russell's affect grid. It's challenging because it's a 2D grid. Any location in that grid is a valid self-report, um, which makes it hard for us to preserve that lock icon, right? We want to give you the ability to quickly get into your phone without forcing you to journal. And so what we do is imp implement this notion of a layer. Um, when he starts the interaction, he drags the thumb to that smaller grid, which is his way of saying that he wants to journal. Um, it zooms, it clicks into, it dwells and clicks into the grid, and then he drags and releases to, to finish the journal. If he doesn't want to journal, he just goes to the lock icon and gets into his phone, right? Again, we're not holding it hostage. Okay, so um, we took these techniques. Uh, we ran a, a fairly small initial study. Um, we see that uh, compared to notifications, the idea of buzzing your phone every 30 minutes to remind you to journal, we are less intrusive. We, we yield much greater frequency of journaling. We get about one and a half, the self, one and a half times the self-reports this way we get versus buzzing you all the time to, to journal. Um, and at about the same timeliness, I won't, I won't dwell on those measures. But the point is we basically win on all of the metrics in some of our initial studies. Um, I think this is a good idea. Um, what it's based in is instead of reminding you, instead of paging you to journal, we make the opportunity to journal easy, visible, and optional. It has to be all three of those things. Um, I think it's a good idea. I don't think it's a great idea. I don't think it's an amazing idea. I don't think it should have taken us 10 years to figure this out. Right? <laughs> um, I think we couldn't have done it until 10 years ago. 10 years ago is when we got capacitive touchscreens. That's where the, this gesture comes from. But prior to that, we had resistive touchscreens, and you didn't do this gesture because it hurt your finger. Uh, but we've been able to do this for 10 years. It shouldn't have taken us 10 years to figure this out. And so, again, it's this idea that our understanding of the tools and what we were trying to do framed our understanding, and we, we, we replayed the pager long after that's what we were actually using. Um, so sometimes it's our understanding of the technology, and sometimes it's actually our understanding of the opportunity that's constrained by the language. And so this is uh, an example of a mobile food journal. Uh, they have their origins in daily recall. This is the idea where you would talk with a provider, um, like a dietitian, and they'll interview you, and they are trained in how to elicit information that you might forget to volunteer. And so for example, if you say you had a sandwich, they will ask you whether or not there was mayonnaise on the sandwich. Right, because it has a large impact on the nutritional content of that sandwich. Um, you can do this to, a variety, to monitor a variety of goals, uh, weight loss, diabetes management, trigger identification. Um, and it's been known to have a, a very high burden. This is very hard to do. Right? People cannot do it for very long. Um, that detracts from its potential benefit. And additionally, the data is often wrong. Right? Because of all of the different estimation errors and memory errors and so on that are happening here, the data is just wrong. But what we did is we got these phones, and we copied this interaction onto them, right? And so I don't want to I don't want to pick on my fitness pal. I don't want to pick on the people who did this. This is an, this enables real time feedback on this. The idea is that instead of writing it down, you do a search in a database, and you get real time feedback on um, the foods that you're journaling. Uh, you often have to break it down. You can't say I had a turkey sandwich. You have to say, well, I had two, two slices of bread, three pieces of lettuce, two slices of turkey, some cheese, and some mustard. Right? You have to break it down like that. Um, and then you'll often get some calorie-based feedback on all of those things. And so this person had a coffee, and they also journaled that they put a little bit of milk in their coffee and some sugar in their coffee. 
Right? And you have to do that for this feedback to be even slightly correct. It's still not right, but it's a little bit closer. Um, and I didn't even have to change the bottom bullet, right? The high burdens detract from the potential benefit, and the data is often wrong, <laughs> because we just copied the interaction over it and we put it on our phone. So um, we did a survey where we, we, we surveyed a bunch of people and said, well, what does healthy eating look like to you? What is it that you want to see about the food that you're eating? We get a variety of responses. We code those. We see things like types of foods, right? They're vegetables, they're fruits, they're proteins. We see qualities of foods. Low, low processed, organic, fresh. And we see qualities of diets that are independent of any one food in the diet. Things like balanced, variety, and portion. None of which are summarized inside of calories, right? So calories does show up, but it's way down at that little red bar down in the distribution. And yet that's the most common thing that we emphasize in this feedback. I'm not saying that doesn't give information to people. I'm saying it's not the entire story, right? And so what we, we um, further saw is it's not just Oh well, we have some other information. Uh, this actually leads people to behaviors which are directly contrary to their goals, right? And so if I want to eat healthier food, and then I start journaling my food in order to eat healthier foods, but then I find that journaling is so much work, it's easier to just eat the food that comes in a package and has a barcode that I can scan it, <laughs> then something's gone horribly wrong along the way, right? And so um, people report avoiding things that were hard to log, they, eat, they report eating foods, foods that have barcodes, they report reducing the variety in their diet so they can eat the same things over and over so that they're easy to journal, they report actively avoiding social situations where there's food because they don't want to have to journal while in the social situation. None of those are good, right? Um, so we, we deployed a fairly simple photo-based food journal, right? This, you just take a picture and, it go, and you're done, right? You can scroll through the history of the pictures you've taken of the food that you eat, right? There's no automatic processing. We're not, we're not selling snake oil, computer vision here, right? Um, but we just go through that. and. One of the things we see is this levels the difficulty of journaling, right? So it, with their prior techniques, 60% of our participants reported that they chose not to journal because it was too hard, right? Another 65% reported not journaling because they didn't actually know what was in the food they were eating, right? And you can't break it down and say what's in the sandwich if you don't know what's in the sandwich, right? Um, with our photo-based capture, only 22% report not journaling because it's too hard. It turns out taking a photo is so hard at like a buffet or at a reception with a bunch of small hors d'oeuvres coming around. It's still hard to pull out the camera and take a picture of every little thing. Right? Um, and nobody <laughs> reports not journaling because they didn't know what was in the food. Um, and so, you know, qualitatively, it's just really easy to take a picture. Um, we also see that this takes away the judgment that comes with journaling. And so our, our participants report choosing not, so everybody forgets. Forgetting to journal is something that happens. You have to account for that in this space, right? But our participants reported with their prior techniques, they would also actively choose not to journal something they were eating because they didn't want this harsh negative feedback from their journal, right? It's somebody's birthday. I walk down the hall to the lab. There's cake. I'm going to have a piece of cake with everybody. I don't need to be reminded that this 150 calories are, puts me over with a big red negative number from my journal, right? Um, so they report this, this feeling of judgment, um, and they say that this goes away with the photos while they still get the feeling of mindfulness. They still t are taking the picture. They're still thinking about whether or not they want to eat this thing without being judged by their phone. And they can look at this history of pictures and identify triggers and trends in their behavior. Right? So they can say, it's not just that I had three pieces of pizza at seminar today. It's that every seminar I have three pieces of pizza. <laughs> Right? Um, they can see that I'm surprised how many things I see in my, that I, I would consider an exception to my diet. Right? I'm actually doing this more often than I think. Um, they can see that I don't branch out as much as I thought I did. Like I've, I've been making a point of trying to go to different restaurants and have different kinds of food in my life, but everywhere I go, I get the same thing. Right? Um, and so they, they, across this diversity of goals that they might be bringing to their, their food, they can still see some of these triggers and trends in that photo history. And so, this is at Kai last year, um, in spite of actual anonymous grumpy R3, um, who says, it should be noted that much of the use of food journaling is in a more clinical setting, with the purpose being sharing and evaluating the journal with nutritionists and care providers. First of all, they're called dietitians now. Um, <laughs> it's not relevant if photos are more or less easily understood by the user if a nutritionist is the eventual consumer of the data. 
okay, this is wrong on like five levels, right? Okay, um, there's a lot of self-tracking going on that is individual people doing it, not necessarily in consultation with the provider. Um, it's not true that your uh, provider can make sense of your self-tracking data. They are completely overwhelmed by it if you bring it to them, right? Um, and even if these points were true, the entire CHI ethos would say that we're about personal empowerment, giving people the ability to accomplish things. And so even if those things were true, we would still want to be pushing against them inside of the CHI community, right? This is wrong on so many levels. But what they're coming from is daily recall, right? They still have a notion of the problem which is talking to your provider to get the most accurate record of your consumption that they can by probing with you and going back and forth to get that full record in an interview context with a health provider. That's their only notion of the problem. So the notion of the problem has spilled over and limited what somebody can consider as a viable technology here. Um, and what I want to say is that we need to expand the language of interaction in the space. We need to be cognizant of these framings that are happening and we need to expand the language of kinds of things that we try to do with self-tracking data. One way that we find useful for thinking about this is this curve between effort and utility in self-tracking. We have a set of things in the world right now which are really easy, right? You go to the store and buy them, you get them as gifts, you wear them for a while, and then you put them in a drawer because they're not really giving you much value, right? It's super easy and fun to buy these things. They're nice consumer devices, but they're not giving us that much value. On the other end of the spectrum, we have these things like you know, food journaling, if, if, you, if uh, you're a recently diagnosed diabetic, if you're um, obese and decide to lose the weight, you can engage in detailed food journaling, in um, very high fidelity food journaling. You can meet with a, a provider every couple days to get the social support and the education they need in terms of that. It works. We have TV shows about how it works, right? It's very expensive. It's very time consuming. It's not a way to get these techniques out into the world and have the, the full impact of them. And so, a way that we find helpful to think about this is that it's useful to push at all points on this curve, right? We can take things, oh, and we have very few things in between right now, right? That's my point, is we need to expand the language in between these endpoints. Um, and one of the ways we can do that is by pushing on all the points on this curve. We can take something which is already easy and make it more valuable, find new ways to make it have greater value in that interaction. We can take something which is really hard and try to reduce the burdens of accomplishing it. We can take something that's really hard scale back some of the value in trade-off for making it a lot easier, right? All points on this curve are, are meaningful as we expand the space. Okay, so the last thing I wanna do is explain why I decided to give this talk. Um, it would have been a lot easier to come down and go deep into one of these three topics, but I've tried to layer this tools perspective across the three of them, right? And that took me a lot of hours this week. Um, but I wanted to give this talk because the full scale arrival of ubiquitous computing, right, whether we call it Internet of Things or, or whatever we call it, has some really deep and interesting questions about the implications of these prior framings and how they're going to apply on the technologies that we build going forward. Um, and I want to show you one more example here. So this is a, a, a detailed record of step tracking as captured by a Fitbit. Right? And so the scenario here is that um, a college student wants to, get, wants to share her detailed activity record on Facebook to get the social support that might come with that. Right? It's one thing to share a badge that says, hey, I walked up the steps or something. Right? But like, there's, no, there's nothing there to support. Right? It just means you've owned a Fitbit for a while. Right? Um, but this is really detailed insight into the activity that this person is undertaking towards her health goals. And we know that that can support a greater level of social engagement with her peers and her support network, and therefore she might get more support in this behavior change. The issue is that she also got a lot of those steps walking home from the bar at 2 a.m. on Tuesday, and that would be that peak on the left, right? Um, and her parents are also on Facebook. And so what she's going to do is highlight that activity and erase it. And then the system is going to automatically reallocate those same steps to a different time of day based on this person's unique historical patterns. Right? It looks at her activity history and says, where can I reallocate these same steps that you've deleted in a manner that is consistent with your personal activity history? Right? So she does that. She highlights the steps, erases them, and they get reallocated more like an evening run or something like that. <laughs> So this is hilarious. Um, 
turns out it's a, it's a, it's a bad idea. Um, the, bur <laughs> the burdens of doing this are really high, of thinking about whether or not you need to do this, right? If you're trying to do the detailed disclosures and there's some interesting issues, questions around trust that come up. Uh, once I know you can modify your data, do I believe that you always did? Um, <coughs> And yet people will say, I would never use this, but I know some people would, and it would be really valuable to them when they, <laughs> <laughs> um, But what I want to push on is the fact that it's hilarious. Um, so part of that is because I'm hilarious. Let's, let's just go with that. Um, but the other thing is that if you, if you look into, like, all, the only thing we just saw was, like, somebody manipulating their privacy settings on Facebook. Right? There, there was nothing going on here that's actually funny. Right? This is no more funny than like unsubscribing from a spam list or opting out of something. Like a person had some value they wanted to get and they wanted to exercise control over an incidental privacy disclosure that was caught up in that. That didn't actually relate to the value that they were trying to get from the data. And it's funny to us because it violates our expectations. Right? If you look at the theories of humor, things are funny when they set up one expectation and then violate it. So why does this violate our expectations? Right? Why is it that sensor data is somehow immutable? Right? Like, no other kind of data that we engage with on a daily basis would we accept that we're never allowed to manipulate it, that we can only consume this data. We, we, we reject that in documents. We reject it in media. Right? We reject it across all kinds of interaction. And somehow, in data like this, it's allowed to go. And it's presumed. And, and I don't know why. Um, and so the reason I want to talk about tools and the reason I'm doing a lot of work in tools and self-tracking right now is I really do see this as a fundamental new kind of data that's emerging. It's coming out a popular consumer practice. It's becoming part of everyday interaction with technology. And the language that we define for that interaction is going to exercise a huge amount of control over who can speak with this data and what they can say with this data. And it's our data, right? It's my data, it's about me, it's for my personal reflection. That's where we started with the definition of why we're even doing this in the first place. And I should have that control. Um, and so Jacob Hoffman Andrews has, has one perspective on this. He says, there is no internet of things, only other people's computers in your house, right? <laughs> and so what is this that we're building? And uh, you know, will this new type of data be something that's for us, something that we can use, something we can adapt to our purposes, or will it just be about us? Right, it will just be the big data that's being fed into somebody else's engine. Right? And so um, I don't have the answer to that. I have some thoughts that I won't say on video. But um, <laughs> it's, it's, a really, it's a really challenging question, given all of the framings that have already been put into place over the years about how we think about these things. OK, so that was my talk. Thank you. I think this is a really interesting set of issues around especially the new kinds of interactions that we're seeing. Um, and I'm wondering if you've given thought to what this next language that we might have actually is. I know that's a super big, hard question. But when you talk about these sort of paradigms of the different programming languages and so on, where do you think that we're headed with all of these devices? So I'll give the version of the answer that I'll say on tape. Um, <laughs> we'll, talk later. we'll have more discussion over mine. I believe our language right now is shaped by take a device, stream the data into a relational database, stick it on the cloud, lock it away, and mine it for um, profitability of the company that is doing this. Um, and I believe it's my data, independent of which application I used to collect it. The law does not support me in that opinion. And so I think we have to change the technology infrastructure to support that context of use um, so that it becomes the way in which we want to approach building these applications. Um, and um, there's a lot of stuff in there in terms of um, we see people stay with applications that they no longer consider a good fit to their, their purpose because they're data invested. Right? They've already got, they've, they've got a sunken cost in all the data that's locked into this existing application. And if they go to something else, they have no way of getting it there. So like data portability is a short answer, but I, I think um, 
it's more subtle than that in terms of the, the market forces that are in play. Which is why I won't talk on tape about it. <laughs> That's a dystopian dark. <laughs> Um, you've been talking about software, but it, doesn't the hardware also constrain the interactions? It does. Um, so yeah, I think at the software stack, that's where, that's where I work. Um, I think there's a bunch of really great research that you can put on that curve between burden and value, where by deploying some new sensor or something like that, you're able to dramatically reduce the burdens of capturing a certain type of information. And that, that's sort of how I would fit that into to my model. Um, and then. Personally, I tend to think more about what do we do with the data once we have it, and, and how do we gather the kinds of data that we can't sense. But I think you're absolutely right. There's like uh, there's a bunch of great work that happens in sensing, which I can map into that, that reducing the burden because we can sort of automate the capture. I have a question. Um, what about I'm worried about where the new ideas are going to come from. I mean, we have the paper, and it goes onto the tablet. We have the pager. We have in the horseless carriage, they typically evolve, but it takes somebody saying, what else could this be? And where did those ideas come from? Well, isn't that all of us? <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and so I, I think, I mean, it's, sli it's a slightly glib answer, but there, there is some kernel of truth inside of it. And then the other thing that we need is a context in which the ideas can emerge after they are had. Right? Um, and so we lament that it takes 20 years for an idea to be out in the world, and, and parts of that can't be shortcut, and parts of it probably could. Um, but we need a, a context where the other approaches, and, and that includes ourselves, right? Because anonymous grumpy R3, right? Um, we have to be aware of the fact that there are not just these two endpoints. We can fill in that entire space. Um, and I think as a community, we sometimes focus on whether something has proven itself to be better than the alternative, whether, rather than whether or not a piece of work has demonstrated a possibility that's worth considering. Um, and I think that's a little bit unfair to ourselves. More? All right, let's thank him again.